Good afternoon, and uh, thank you for joining us on this session, Automated uh, PySpark to Snowpark Assessment and Conversion. I myself, I'm, a, I'm Puneet Lakhanpal. I'm the field CTO for data science um, at Snowflake, but I also lead a lot of uh, PySpark to Snowpark conversions with Snow Convert. Here's uh, my partner, Mauricio. Mauricio, you want to introduce yourself? Yes. Hi, everybody. My name is Maurice Rojas, and I'm part of the Professional Service Workload Solution. And uh, I work alongside with Benin and, and our people from engineering, helping people to move to the snow park and to identify any opportunities for improvement. And um, like, and if people is like facing with any challenges, we are there to help. So what we are going to be covering today in this session is we're going to start with just the basics of why snow park over spark. You know, what are the challenges with spark? Why would you even consider, you know, snow park? In the keynote, you heard from Frank as to like, you know, Snowpark is, you know, two to four times faster and more cost performing than Spark. We'll kind of get into like, you know, what are some of those reasons? And then uh, he also said that, you know, when you use Snowpark over PySpark, uh, essentially, there's just free money that is, you know, you can reclaim back because, you know, it's just the price performance that really drives, you know, how, you know, why would you use Snowpark? And then towards the end, like, how would you convert that into real business decisions? So that's where we'll start. Then we'll give a one single example of like a real world use case where you know this customer actually migrated over from Spark uh, over to Snowpark. What were the challenges? What were the the cost savings associated with that? Then we'll give a brief uh, overview of what is this Snow Convert uh, that we are going to be talking about today. Just a brief overview of what are the different modes in this particular tool. And then uh, Mauricio would actually you know end with like a full end-to-end uh, -end live demo of basically how to actually use this tool on a Spark notebook, do assessment on it, you know, basically show what are the reports that kind of come out of it and then also do a conversion and, you know, all of that is going to be shown live today. So when we talk about Spark, these are the, some of the challenges uh, that we have kind of noted working with Spark. So before this role, I used to do a lot of Spark myself. And essentially what I also noticed was, you know, when you're working with the, you know, Spark jobs, uh, there are several reasons the jobs can just simply fail. So when you're working with Spark, it's not just one single platform that you're working with. Uh, essentially, you know, you have to make sure that all these different technologies actually are stitched together to build a data pipeline. So for example, on AWS, you know, let's say you're working with the Spark, you have to ensure that all those IAM roles have to be appropriate if you're working with some S3 buckets those bucket policies need to be associated and uh, you know tied appropriately and then let's say you know those are just some of the reasons when you're you know building those data pipeline in the spark you know that might be one of the reasons that the the job could actually fail and also all of these jobs are like very you know memory dependent so what that means is when the the job is actually memory dependent let's say it fails it's hard to kind of understand what was the reason behind it and also the driver logs which actually maintain that information it's hard to kind of get that telemetry out so that is one of the challenges that has been noticed with Spark. Then we go on to poor performance. So, so what? why do we say that it's uh, poor performance with Spark? So when you're working with Spark, let's say you set up like auto scaling, right? So you go from one to 10 nodes. There's so much time that is actually spent in just spinning up those particular nodes. So if you have some SLAs where you have to kind of adhere to some requirements, you know, what you would either do is either just over provision a non auto scale cluster and just you know use that particular cluster because you have strict SLAs that you have to adhere to or you would just keep a you know cluster running at all times and just you know although only at certain times you would need that particular cluster uh, you know the cluster would be you know on so that there's no time that is spent in just bringing the time you know cluster up so that if you have some strict SLAs that really you know results in like you know poor performance from that perspective now, also, uh, another reason could be is that, let's say, you know, if you have connected a particular notebook to a, a Spark cluster, right, you're tied to that particular Spark cluster. Um, and if you really want a different Spark cluster for a different set of a job, you have to really split out that functionality to multiple notebooks, maintain those different Spark clusters, and really, you know, maintain a pipeline. So it's tough to kind of maintain all these, uh, you know, different jobs because it is always connected to a single particular cluster. Uh, otherwise, you have to separate out the code functionality and associate that into multiple clusters. So that also results in like poor performance being tied to a single cluster. Um, and then excessive cost or resources. So in this problem statement that I mentioned before, like it's tough to basically figure out what is the optimal cluster that is required for your particular job. So many times you would spend a lot of time either just looking into 
you know, ganglia metrics, figuring out like how much is the CPU and the memory utilization. When you uh, basically trigger that particular job, is my cluster really being utilized to the maximum or not? So it's a, it's a tough to job to kind of uh, figure out what is the optimal cluster. And that results in like, you know, excessive costs because really it's a lot of effort kind of goes into that. So, um, and then the cost is not just a technological cost. It's also a resource cost as well, because, you know, when you're working with Spark, definitely those resources who know Spark in and out, they're very like, you know, scarce in a the sense. They're like highly skilled people who know how to actually set all those uh, Spark options. How do you, you know, partition the data? How do you actually, you know, make use of those uh, different options to kind of, you know, get them working. So from a resource perspective as well, it's cost intensive. So let's say if I'm a data engineer and when I'm working with Spark, it's a, it's a common theme that 80% of the time is just gone into data preparation, making sure that the data actually ties together. So, you know, most of the time is spent into figuring out like if there is any data quality or any silos, taking care of those issues. But really like, you know, where I would want to spend time is basically creating the business value, which ends up being only the 20% of my time. So. I would rather spend time creating the business value rather than just stitching the data together and figuring out like, you know, how to actually get access to this particular data. So that is uh, like a real challenge of, uh, of Spark. And in fact, the customer use case that I will walk you through, uh, that this was the main challenge where, you know, the resources were scarce, the engineers were just working on just figuring out how to connect the data together. So this is actually a real world use case from which this, uh, you know, slide has been derived. So what is Snowpark? So Snowpark for us is like a developer first programmability platform. So what that really means is if you are a Java developer, Python developer, Scala developer, or just want to work with SQL, you can just use all these different languages, uh, you know, whatever language of choice you have and use it with Snowflake for doing your job, whether it's data engineering, data science, data apps. So all of that is possible through Snowpark. So how this really simplifies the architecture is that, you know, instead of just, let's say if the data is sitting somewhere, and instead of taking the data out of that particular platform and then process it somewhere else, Snowpark actually allows you to bring your code to where your data lies. So essentially, let's say, you know, if you have a data repository and there are so many applications who want to basically do data analytics on it or, you know, extract some information so that they can, you know, report out to their business stakeholders. So a lot of time actually is spent into just extracting the data out processing it somewhere and then showing the results. But what Snowpark does is it allows you to just push down your code into where the data lives. So from that perspective, you know, there's a better data governance. There's a cohesive story around just a single platform to actually streamline the architecture. All the, the stuff that kind of comes around with role-based access control with Snowflake actually gets used from the, from the bottom to the top. So that's what Snowpark provides. Another thing that I also mentioned, uh, you know, remember the problem that I mentioned about like, let's say if you're using a notebook, if you can connect it to a single Spark cluster, but then if you have a code complexity where, you know, let's say, um, let's talk about a pipeline where let's say if you wanna load the data first and then you wanna transform it and then basically do, do some feature engineering and then data science, right? These are all different parts of the job that actually can reside in a single notebook. But if you do that, you know, there might be a need where you only need small amount of resources to actually load the data. Uh, then you need higher number of resources to actually do some data transformations, maybe even higher set of machinery to actually do feature engineering and then some other type of machinery, right? So how you would do that with Spark is you would cut that into separate notebooks, not with Snowpark. So with Snowpark, uh, essentially, you know, with Snowpark, you can instantaneously switch uh, to a different particular warehouse in the same notebook. So you, you're not uh, basically tied to a particular compute. So you can just say session.use warehouse, give it a warehouse name and instantaneously you switch to that warehouse within the same workflow. So that is extremely powerful because now you're not tied to a particular compute. Now also what uh, Snowpark also uh, allows is like asynchronous API based uh, you know, data engineering, for example. So let's say if you have multiple queries, you wanna start up a multi-cluster warehouse and you send like multiple queries asynchronously to a multi-cluster warehouse. That is exceptional with Snowpark where you can just, you know, say, set a parameter called block equal to false, and then all these particular queries would go into a Snowflake multi-cluster warehouse. The clusters would kind of come up and then scale down as well to kind of basically save the cost. So that's also extremely powerful that when you com combine Snowpark with multi-cluster warehouse, you really see like cost performance actually increasing a lot. So this is a real world use case. It's a customer named IQVIA. So basically, you know, they're a global leader in uh, basically providing technological solutions and services to life sciences industries. So this particular use case with Snowpark, you know, that was around a 
a CDAS suite, which is like a clinical data analytics suite that they were building. So what that is, is basically it's a platform or a data foundation framework that they have where basically they collect data, uh, you know, almost 24 seven in near real time from different set of data sources across different countries. So basically at scale, they are, you know, collecting the information they are, since there are so many disparate systems uh, that are involved, they are actually transforming that into a single, uh, you know, data repository. And then, you know, when you're doing your business at this scale, you know, what really matters is, do you actually have the domain experts to transform the data? And what is the language of choice that they should be using? So in this particular use case, you know, they were using uh, Hadoop, Hive, and Spark, but then in that whole architecture, they were essentially, you know, there was some unexpected complexity and scaling issues. So from a domain expertise uh, point of view, they did not have the, the developers to kind of maintain the, the Spark pipelines. Uh, because like uh, the domain experts, uh, it was very easy to onboard them onto SQL. So how SQL kind of works with Snowpark is, let's say once you define a Snowpark user-defined function, although it would be Python or a Scala, right? You could still use that particular function in a SQL language because at the end, it's just a first party object that sits right underneath. So through that particular mechanism, you really democratize what language you're actually writing and how you're using it. So if there's a data engineer who actually codes that function in Python, any business user can use it because underneath the, the scenes, they don't need to know that it's Python. They can just use it in a SQL function. So onboarding of the business users is extremely beneficial in this particular use case. And not only, so how they did this conversion was, uh, they kind of converted all this stuff into Snowpark user-defined functions, which is like, you know, user-defined function is just like, let's say if you write some Python code, let's say one row goes in, one row goes out, that's a Snowpark user-defined function. So you, there's another variant of that, which could be a vectorized user-defined function or a user-defined table function where more data goes in, more data goes out. And all of that work is kind of distributed across with Snowpark, across all the nodes. So let's say if you have a a large Snowflake warehouse, you would distribute the work across eight nodes. And if you have an extra large, you, you know, you'll distribute across 16 nodes and so on and so forth. So in this case, they use a Snowpark user-defined function that allowed them to basically get the cost savings up, up to 3x as compared to the Spark. And also they got a big boost because the architecture was simplified in the sense that, you know, the business users now could use the function that is written in Python just in pure SQL language. So that's uh, really powerful. And then, you know, they didn't really have to they could really easily, you know, create these particular pipelines now with the Snowpark UDFs. So what is Snow Convert? Um, so that's something, you know, that's a tool that was kind of mentioned in the title of the uh, your session. So essentially Snow Convert is a high fidelity conversion tool that was uh, you know, built by Snowflake. And essentially what that allows is, let's say if you have any Spark code base, you know, you want to understand what it will take to actually convert that code into Snowpark and how, you know, are there going to be any glitches during the, the, the pathway for that? So that's, this is what the tool does. So it has two modes. One is a qualification mode. So in the qualification mode, basically what happens is, you know, it basically scans the code base. It basically, you know, has its own internal inbuilt, uh, it builds a abstract syntax trees and then symbol tables and then spits out uh, some reports to the users. So those reports could be like, you know, they could be static reports and we also have access to some dynamic reports. You know, once the user actually runs that particular tool, essentially it kind of understands if this particular tool is a good candidate for, you know, Snowpark migration or if more manual work is sort of needed or not. So let's say, so this particular qualification mode is free for anyone to use. You can just download the tool and free of course, you can just run the assessment on your code repo and understand if it's a good candidate for conversion or not. And then it kind of gives you a session ID and that session ID, it, you know, is uh, emailed to you as well. And then you can share that with a Snowflake, uh, you know, professional service resource. And then they'll be able to kind of, you know, create some dependency graphs as from like, let's say if you had some nested chain of dependencies in your code, they'll be able to kind of understand and show you like, hey, these are the dependencies. And uh, also kind of basically see like if there are any particular warnings that you can expect before the conversion has happened or if there are going to be any errors or any workarounds. So all of that information, you know, we have access to and we can kind of share that with you. But it's really just free of cost to see like, you know, what it would take to kind of convert that. And then secondly, in the conversion mode, um, it actually converts the code as well to Snowpark so that you can actually make it run inside of, uh, you know, Snowflake. So the language that are supported uh, for this particular tool is PySpark as well as Spark for Scala. And then we support this platform on EMR which is the AWS version for Spark, and then also Databricks, uh, both Azure Databricks and AWS Databricks. So this is uh, just a mind map of, you know, what the Snow Convert assessment does. So this is in the qualification mode when you run it. 
you know, basically takes that, you know, code repository, scans it, you know, builds the uh, abstract syntax tree, populates symbol tables, spits out like if there are any, you know, errors going to be in that or, you know, what are the, all the files in the code repository. Some of those files could be Python, some of those could be JSON files. So it can, uh, or it could be shell files. So um, since the objective is to kind of, you know, assess what it would take for Spark code to be converted to a Snowpark. So basically it keeps track of all the files, the keywords, the Spark references, keywords, as well as the issues. And then essentially that particular session ID for that run can be shared with Snowflake to kind of, you know, explore more as to like, what is the readiness score? Like, is it 70% compatible? Is it 95% compatible? All of that information can be uh, obtained from this assessment. And then lastly, this conversion, which is again, does all the same thing as to like understands what the code is, but in terms of the reports, what it does is like, it actually converts the code as well. But then inside of the code conversion, it, you know, either it would make a direct replacement of a PySpark based API to a Snowpark based API. If there is any rename of the classes needed, it would do that. If there are any sort of helpers needed where, let's say, if uh, there is a code, uh, if there is an API in PySpark, which is not directly supported, but let's say if there is a workaround, which our team knows, given, you know, we have done so many of these assessments, we'll actually do the helper uh, conversions as well, and also transformation automatically as well with this tool. Now, in the cases where direct conversion is not possible, you know, it spits out some information as to like, why did not convert? And then uh, is there any particular workaround as well? So there's a very good documentation uh, that is available with this as well, which Mauricio will be showing you. Um, so this is our way to kind of automatically assess and convert PySpark or, you know, Scala-based Spark code into Snowpark. So when we actually qualify this particular code, right, there are two modes. Sometimes we find that the customer's code did not even have any Spark code. So it, it was only just pure Python or pandas or maybe using the Snowflake Python connector. We still want to help and basically accelerate those particular workloads. Although it doesn't qualify as a, as a Snowpark migration program, it still qualifies as a Snowpark acceleration program. So we are here to just, you know, help the customer accelerate what the workload is and, you know, make the best use of their investment. And that's what the, that program is built for. In case any Spark references are found, that would be termed as a Snowpark migration candidate. And then, you know, we'll be there to basically help out the customer in both the assessment and the conversion stuff. So now Mauricio would actually walk you through a live demo of actually how to actually use this tool. Thank you, Vinny. So now it's demo time. And uh, before I, I jump into that, I want to say that code conversions can be complex. And as a company that believes in data, we think that um, data allows you to take informed decisions and will allow you to better understand what are the tasks at hand when you're going to make a migration. As part of that, this uh, Snowpo Bird is going to be collecting a lot of information. Some of that is a set of static reports. A, a lot like medical exams, some of these reports require like a free night and, and also some scrutiny or unserved revision. As believers of our own platform, we have created like a, a Streamlit app that allows the professional services to walk you through the information that has been collected by Snowconvert. This application allows us to see like different details of your application. So we can see like we have a, a vision of all the mappings that are currently available. We can also look at different levels, like there's unsupported APIs, we can look at them. And there's different levels of details, like for example, the dependency analysis, which I think is a super valuable tool allows you to understand the relationships inside your code. A typical exercise when you're looking at, at a huge workload is, where do I start? And even if I choose a place to start, how do I know how to make a slice of the code that I want to migrate? And even if I take that slice, how can I determine what is the effort? Is this the right slice? Is this going to have some level of like complexity or some risk that I have, have to consider? So this is the kind of information that professional services uh, analyzes uh, with information that is no convert produces. And we will uh, give you some examples. Um, once you have collected that information, uh, we can then like, help you to set up a migration plan. And also it's no convert not only that assessment, but it also can help with the conversion. Um, when you're doing a conversion from Spark to Snowpark, uh, the Python is not the problem. Uh, it's no part for Python, supports any Python construct, any Anaconda library that is supported in our channel, and any pure Python library can be easily onboarded. So the main challenge is to identify what is a risk, what is not supported. And in, this, in the case of a Spark migrations, is the Spark API that you're using. Which files are using it? Which files have like, uh, and once like the tool identifies those things, automates those changes. 
which can be very cumbersome and repetitive. So like if as you can see in this side by side, can be seen as the imports from PySpark are identified and replaced. Any Spark API that is identified is as well replaced or adapted in case that some transformations are needed. And also the tool will introduce some comments in particular points where like highlights or warnings or observations will be like a great guide for the person that is doing the conversion. So let me just like now uh, give you a more detailed walkthrough. So for this example, we're going to use uh, this application. So let me, okay. So this is the sample application that we are going to be presenting. Uh, in here we have some Python files for some ETL jobs and some, uh, some of those files like have relationship between different files and we have an notebook. Is the font size okay or should we increase it? Can you see it? Okay. And um, this is like a, a notebook from our favorite pandemic of the last few years that uh, like shows like how you create a, a Spark session, then like uh, it's called presenting some columns, uh, adding additional columns, doing some some select, some sort, some um, like other uh, typical operations that you will have in, in a normal Jupyter notebook that you typically use for data engineering. Okay. So from here, we will be able to uh, get you some information. So let me just show the kind of information that we can get here. So when the, uh, when you run the tool, you get the session ID and with the session ID, you can then like get reports. And these reports like provide like, obviously we have summary information about like the size of your code. And then you get like readiness scores. I will get into more details in, into that um, in a few moments. It gets breakdowns and different aspects and um, information about the APIs that are collected. But we, not only we have that, we are professional services uh, is able to give you like a very deep analysis of all the unsupported elements. We can dive to uh, knowledge bases about like the any uh, API that is not currently automated. We can do dependency analysis of the one that we show and we will give you like an example or do breakdowns per file to uh, know specifically in each file of the workload what is the current status. As well, we, there are other analysis that can be done like if, whether you have readers and writers and like maybe create an inventory of all the sources that you're reading the kind of formats that are ingested in your, in your files, which are the files that are producing the ingestion or the, or the production of data sets and uh, third party analysis in the case that uh, some of your workload is not using Spark or is using other third party uh, libraries that need to be analyzed. Or even if you have some jobs, like we can take the JSON definition of your jobs and like use that to visualize how those jobs are executed and even accelerate the creation of some tasks and procedures out of those job definitions. So, but how do we get here? I think that, let me go, uh, take you through that journey. So in order to accelerate this journey, as, as what is playing, we have the Snow Convert tool, uh, which uh, has support for like several SQL dialects. In, in this case, we're interested into the Spark languages. So you get it started, you press a new project. Let me just uh, type some name. You select the source code will be Python and we browse to, I have uh, downloaded my Git repository previously. So I just point to it. Uh, then you select an output folder. This is the folder where the output of the, uh, the, the raw reports from the assessment will be uh, produced. And as you convert, uh, the output of the conversion will be there. And you type an email. This email is important because this is where you will get the session ID that allows uh, when you reach professional services, we will use that to track your information. Uh, I will recommend you use your business email and let's just like company name. Okay. So we are good to go. Oh, I had previously run this, so I will just replace the previous executions. So when this tool run, all the things that uh, Punit had already explained, parsing of the code, the analysis, feature extraction, all the things happen. As you saw, the process is pretty quick. Usually it will be like a few seconds or a few minutes. Obviously, if you're processing like megabytes of code, uh, the time will vary, uh, but in general, it's, it's a very quick process. At this moment, you can click view results and it's almost everything that was found is a straight cut. Like there's like a very um, 
not a lot of highlighters of any challenges, we will just right away tell you that this is a good candidate for migration. And, um, and they will have some other information. You have the total number of files, the execution time, the identify the Spark references, which is a key element to consider, and the count of the Python files. And down the bottom, you have like a build-up folder. That is mostly if you had some problems during the execution, you just like uh, reach professional services with the contents of those logs, and we can help you in uh, just in, in case of any, any challenge. And there's like your reports, which is just like the raw reports that the tool collects when it's running and sending telemetry. Let's see at the files that we have. So we have a files inventory, which is pretty basic. It's a, uh, an analysis of all the files that were in your workload. Uh, this is important because we need to really understand the composition of the code that you have and the, that we actually process that the majority of the elements are important for this workload. When we're running for Python, only Python files are going to be analyzed. But what happens if you have a lot of SQL files? What happens if you have a lot of shell scripts, uh, YAML files, configuration files? What if there are like C++, Java, or R? Like that will allow us to know that and also highlight that maybe there are other things that you need to consider so you don't like make a, a false assumption that you have processed all the code. As well, we collect some keywords. These keywords are mostly like analysis of like key indicators uh, in your files. Again, this is done. So for example, if you have some configuration files that might even include some um, uh, Python constructs or some SQL, we can then use that to indicate that uh, we found some files that are not Python, but there's like indicators that this, there's probably some important code inside of it. So that's, uh, that is why we are collecting that. And we also run some pattern recognition in order to find some interesting patterns in the code. The issues file is a set of uh, insights that have been found from the tool. So you will have some codes. These codes point to documentation into the Snow, uh, Snow Convert website. We will see a little more about that. And this, it has like a brief description and a, a category. Some of them are just marked as warning, which means there's no additional manner work. It's informational information, especially because there are differences in the platform. So you can look at that into our documentation to really understand why there are differences and like yes to be informed about those things and like finally we have the spark references inventory which is uh, a collection of all the apis from the spark libraries that were identified by our work so with all that information we can now jump to the stream lead application and see a little more, more details so this detail report is one of the static reports that you get i think that probably i need to make this a little bigger to make it uh, clear uh, in the screen. So one of the first things, as, as we mentioned, we have the 289 identified usages. And this is going to, like, from those from 289, you see that we have 285 that says that they're ready for conversion. So that will give us a readiness score. Out of those 275, there might be a percentage that can be automatically converted by the tool. In this case, it's like all the 275, which that's amazing because it means that everything that, uh, well, all those 275 uh, API references are identified and they will be completely automated And when, when you run the conversion process. Then you have like a listing of the files. A good thing to consider here is like, you see that we have 20 files, when these part usages are only in 10 files. That's all another important aspects because when you're looking at your complete workload, the files are really going to give you effort are the files that have PySpark. As, as we said before, Python code is just going to something that you can just take over to your platform. And obviously there will be some additional exceptions that we can see into additional reports. But in general, that those are the ones that you're going to focus your job. The tools also look for embedded SQL. It's very common in PySpark pipelines that they are mostly drivers for SQL execution. And we want to make sure that we are not only looking at the Python, but also at the SQL snippets that might be embedded in your code. So if we find like a significant amount of that, they will, that we can extract them and also provide an analysis of the sparse SQL or, or HQL or other dialects that are present there and, and drive them through the uh, other tools of the Snow Convert. The sizing is important because that is an indicator of complexity. So it, like we know that the bigger the, the size of the file, the bigger the opportunity to introduce complex code. 
So if your distribution of files is, is in the like in a smaller categories, smaller quantiles, um, it's usually that you have a, a better opportunity of, of like having less uh, problems during migration. This is an important analysis of the APIs that were identified. So from all the APIs that are identified, we have a subset of them that are called as, as direct APIs. And those APIs means that there's like there's a straight, like a direct equivalent. Those APIs have like exact the same API in a snow park. And that's the best majority of them. So that's amazing. Renamings are just like APIs with a different like a slide seat and name in the name of the APIs or some parameters. And the tool just takes care of them. Helpers are situations where the tool considers that it's better to introduce some kind of helper snippet that will take care of some operation that is maybe not equivalent. And then the tool will introduce that code into, into the migrated code. Transformations are like syntactic differences. Like there are some API that have like a very different structure and it will be like a very repetitive work to just, and also very error prone. And so that's, those are the kind of things that we want to do for you. Not supported are mostly things that are not needed in our platform. Just to give an example that maybe not applies in Spark is like indexes. You don't need indexes in a Snowflake. Repartitions, you don't need repartitions in a Snowpark. So those are things that are not supported. So they are not necessarily in, mean that you have some kind of a manual work. In most cases, just like things that are, don't apply in our platform. And not defined are like things that are recognized as by Spark references but they are not yet into the uh, library of rules of the tool. So like we let you know that uh, at this moment, we can recognize them, we can locate them, but uh, we can create inventories, but we don't have an automation rule that can be used in those cases. If you want to do like deeper analysis, we can see exactly the number of unsupported elements, which elements are not supported. And if we follow the links, we can see like knowledge information and we can also do a drill down to see which occurrences uh, were found. If we are running in conversion mode, we can even see the lines, uh, the particular lines that had it. In this case, you can see that the number of usages is particularly low. So it, it's a good indicator that uh, that can be mapped. And also we have links here of workarounds and other information that the professional services can provide in case you're facing any problem. As I mentioned, dependency analysis is also super important. So let me, for example, run it. If I run the dependency, generate the dependency report, I will get like a breakdown of files and immediate dependencies. If you have files with low dependency counts, those are good candidates because that means that those files are mostly isolated. So you can start with them. It might be like, a, but other things that you might like, like to have an answer is, are they anaconda ready? If you want to know that, then you can download a report which will let you know all the imports for, for each of the files. The colors indicate whether they are Anaconda ready. That means that they're already in the packages. And if they're known, they, well, they, they be highlighted as, as non-supported. Also, if you want to do like a more like deeper analysis, let me choose, for example, this customer mapping. Put it here, show the dependency graph. Okay, we have, um, we have the dependency graph. I'm going to open it. And let me visualize this. So as reported before, we had that this file had four dependencies, which are this, and you also get the numbers of the dependencies. But these files bring along these other dependencies. So we know now don't have four dependencies, we have seven dependencies. And these other files bring along other dependencies. So this is important because like you might like have the false assumption that uh, you only needed to work with four files, but in, in fact, you need a lot of other files. And right now we're only doing a coloring per, per level. The other colorings of the graph can be provided like a coloring per, uh, by, uh, by readiness. And again, like for example, uh, you can have a breakdown per file. If we look at the readiness per file, the files within that graph are all like like with a hundred percent, hundred percent of readiness. So though that is like a very good candidate for migration. So that is like also very good. And we only have a, a file that is not ranking very high, but it's still the lines of code are, are very small. So it is probably not like very challenging. So now when you have done all this analysis, the idea is that we walk through like professional services to create a, a great timeline. And then you can continue to the conversion. Conversion is not yet available freely to everybody. 
So if you are interested in the conversion, you can reach to professional services and we can discuss an option to make the conversion available for you. And um, I have, in the interest of time, I will just jump to the converted code. So let me um, show you. First, close some stuff in the, uh, in the desktop. Okay. And um, let me just open this. I will open this in Visual Studio Code. I'm just using Visual Studio Code because like I, it's a freely available IDE and it provides like a very good experience. We uh, in Snowflake have this Snowflake station that allows to connect and execute things so you can do all your work inside of Visual Studio. It has great integration with, uh, with Git. So if I, I want to personalize my code, it works well. And it also it has support for like Jupyter Notebook. So, uh, I think it's a, it's, it's a good option. It, we are not, you're not bound to use VS code. If you want to use IntelliJ or any other ID, you're perfectly fine with it. So we, this is the output of the code. You see like these kind of marks. Oh, I forgot to show you about this, this, this marks, as I mentioned before, these marks are found in the documentation. And I think that if we look at the report before, you see that we have like a ranking of all the uh, different elements. For example, let me take this code and let me look for this code here. So if I look for this code, we'll see like, uh, it says that this is a warning category. It gives like a description. So in Spark, for example, you have to use the Spark context in order to be able to perform some SQL related operations. Spark context is not needed in a snow park. You can just like drive those operations directly from, from the session. So if you're like trying to strike the context for the session, those, they are just removed and then like the tool will indicate some marks that those things are not necessarily needed. And, and, and it happens with the rest of the codes. Like the, these codes will give you like examples of the original code, the target code, and some explanations and even some guides of workarounds and other things. So let's now see if the like running this code in Snowpark. So this is now a Snowpark uh, code and loading the CSVs and running the operations. As you can see, like now we have this code running in a snow park and we have a great experience. So let me just uh, jump back to the presentation. Yeah, so just to summarize, right? Like, you know, when you use this tool for assessment, it's free for all. If you want to continue that to conversion, you need an access code, which you can basically, you know, reach out to professional services and actually convert the code as well. So it's just an access code that is needed to run to the conversion. And then in the last Visual Studio example, it was a, the same code that was running in Spark, now actually running in Snowpark, which actually went through the Snow Convert conversion. When you're considering end-to-end -end migrations, uh, professional services usually recommend to see that as, as a, a phases that you have to, uh, to view uh, or, or consider. So the first stage is the discovery stage, which is like what is automated by the Snow Convert. So you get all the inventory, you get the uh, conversion assessments, and you get a lot of information to drive the decision. Conversions, code conversions can be complex. Like they might depend on the context. They might depend on the project objectives. They might, they might depend on, on business. Um, we think that we can help you through, through the journey and professional services can offer a snow part readiness assessment where very meticulous analysis of recurring architecture and a proposal of a target architecture taking advantage of like the latest snowflake opportunities. And are considered and also a timeline of how to execute this that is aligned with your your with your current like resources or your or business needs can be produced once all this planning has been created like again like uh, the key for a, a good migration is a good migration plan but once you have created all the plan then you get to execution execution is like uh, much easier you have you get your converter code if there's like things that were not automated you finish them and then you go to the data validation, which is like you run the end-to-end -end or you know, pipeline, and then you compare the results with the end-to-end -end execution of the migrated pipeline. And then you can do like the proper work to move that to production in, in, the, in the go live. Uh, we recommend that you also consider some innovations that can be added. Like now that considering you're coming from a legacy and you have a lot of new opportunities, those are also considered as part of the process. As a, like final detail, we are uh, like migrations involve many aspects. We have been uh, talking here about code conversion and briefly about data validation, but there are many aspects that you consider when you're moving your workloads 
and just like keep them in mind. That's sort of like, uh, and during our migration readiness, we will go through all, the, all of these aspects. In this session, we have only talked about growth conversion. The final takeaways is like, uh, as, as we indicated, it's no convert, it's available for you to download it, try it, get your assessment. If you want to go through like a deeper revision of the inside, professional services is there to, to guide you through the journey. And I think that really accelerates your, uh, your uh, path to mobilize to the data cloud. Thank you, everyone.